Well, good morning, everybody. We're so glad that you're here. It's going to be a great day in God's house. I hope you're ready to sing and worship and open up God's Word and fellowship together. It's going to be great. So if you're happy to be here, let me hear you say amen. Amen. Okay, you're moderately happy to be here. That's good. If you're really happy to be here, let me hear you say amen. Come on. All right, we're going to sing about God's power and His greatness. Would you please stand together as we sing this great hymn? Psalm 24 says, Who is the King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and lift them up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Let's sing it, church. I sing the mighty power of God that made the Sure. 
seen, friends. Find someone you've not said hello to. Welcome them to church this morning, and then you may be seated. Thank you and be seated. In a world that feels unstable, in a time that feels tumultuous, we stop to say thank you to those who were willing to be the stability and chose to advocate for peace, who saw a vision for the country that is safe and secure, formidable and full of freedom. Thank you to each veteran who stepped into endless days and stood watch over long and dark nights, who left family and home and sacrificed personal security to follow in the remarkable footsteps of fellow veterans who came before. When the time came and the nation needed you, you answered the call and have left your own brave imprint on this country. Thank you is never enough. But we are thankful. The greatest freedom that we have is obviously found in the blood of Jesus Christ. But there's a freedom we all enjoy that's been bought with the blood of so many people who have sacrificed on our behalf so that we could be here this day. So if you have served or are serving in any of our military branches, would you please stand now? Would you join me in welcoming them? So thankful for these men and women and for the families that have stood by them. My name is Robert Seaborn. I am the senior adult pastor here at First Fairhope, and I'm so thankful that y'all have joined us here on this beautiful day that the Lord has given us. It wasn't promised to us, but we are here, and we get to celebrate together his name and all of his glory. If you're a visitor with us, we're so thankful that you have chosen to join us today. We would love to have a record of that. You can do that by filling out the Connect card that's in front of you and leaving it in one of the offering plates at the back, or you can simply text the word welcome to the number that you see on these screens behind us. It's going to be and already is a great day. The Lord has given us this day the breath in our lungs so that we can bring glory to him. So it's already been a glorious day in the Lord, and there is more to come as we celebrate his name. So would you join me in prayer as we continue to worship? Father, we thank you so much for this day. And certainly as this weekend, as we have remembered uh, all those that have served in our military branches over the years to protect the freedoms that are so precious, Lord, sacrificed by so many, but I am always reminded, Lord, that sacrifice was demonstrated by you on the cross. It is a life given for others so that we would be able to know you. So as we go through this day in singing and in the message that is to come from Eric, let us always be reminded that it is you, Lord Jesus, that deserves all of our attention and all of our praise and you get all of the glory, Lord. May that be given from us to you today. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Robert. Tell you what, it's such a, we enter into this season of Thanksgiving. Of course, we are thankful for those who have served in our armed forces. We're thankful for how God has continued to be with us in the low places as well as the high places. Last Sunday, our children introduced a song to us. It wasn't brand new to some of you, but it was new to many of you. It's called Graves into Gardens. So I'm going to ask you to see what you remember from last week. And let's offer God our worship for, the, for his presence in the low places and his presence in the high places. Let's stand together as we sing. I search the world. I search the world, but it couldn't fill me. Man's empty praise and treasures that fade 
but never enough. Then you came along and put me back together. And every desire is now satisfied here in your love. Oh, there's nothing. Oh, there's nothing. song so it's coming back to you I'm sure let's sing it together I'm not afraid I'm not afraid to show you my weakness my failures and flaws Lord you see them all and still call me friend cause the God The God of the valley, there's not a place your mercy and grace won't find me again. Oh, there's nothing better than you, there's nothing better than you, Lord, there's nothing. great song.
heart with blood wholeheartedly my soul undeserving sing this chorus God you're so good oh God you're so Just to be able to be in your presence as a church family, to be able to lift up your name is such an incredible honor. And I pray, God, that as you incline your ear to what we share today, as we open up your word, I pray, God, that you speak into our lives. Let there not be a person here, Lord, that doesn't leave unchanged in some way. So, God, we pray that in all that happens today, that the name of Jesus is lifted high. And I pray, Father, whatever might distract us today, that, Lord, you'd give us the wisdom and the capability to sit down. So, God, we love you and bless you. It's in your precious name we pray. Amen. You may be seated.
We'll open your Bibles this morning to Matthew chapter 5. We're going to look a key verse in verse 12. We'll be looking together throughout the Sermon on the Mount this morning. Matthew chapter 5, verse 12. And as you're finding your way to your text this morning, let me uh, give a word uh, of thanks uh, to our choir uh, and uh, worship ministry this morning. Uh, why don't you help me uh, in thanking them? Uh, I'm powerfully reminded as I, as I benefit, and choir, y'all listen, as I benefit from your leadership, uh, musicians, as I benefit from your leadership and investment uh, in leading us well, I want you to know not only am I blessed by your voices and by your talent, uh, I have none of that talent uh, of my own, and so I'm able to export that to you and, and benefit from your, your beautiful voices, but much much, frankly, much more important to me uh, is the beauty of your countenances. That's the, the power and benefit of, 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 a, of a choral ministry is you, is you reflect the glory of God to us. And uh, because I've been your pastor now for almost seven years, I know most of the stories. And so as you give glory to God and you give testimony of God's goodness, you give testimony of God's faithfulness in the midst of suffering, I, I know uh, the stories uh, of God's faithfulness, but I also know your, know your stories of, of pain and hurt and loss. Uh, and to see you stand uh, and give glory to God and thanks to him for his goodness, uh, even um, uh, when you uh, have walked through valley times, is a tremendous testimony to me. And it's a tremendous gift to your church. And it's not lost on us. So in this season of Thanksgiving, I want to, uh, for the rest of us non-talented people, uh, in your mind's eye, in your memory, pick one or more of these choir folks uh, that, you, that you were blessed by today. Make sure you find them and thank them. Uh, often we, we benefit and, and uh, are blessed by, but sometimes are forgetful to give thanks. Uh, and we need to do that. And of course, thank you, uh, Pastor Scott, for your uh, great leadership and friendship as well. All that's bonus material, right? Okay, that is not included in the sermon length. Okay, so I get all, all of that for, uh, for free. Amen. <laughs> thank you. Well, I was... Uh, uh, struggling a little bit as I uh, thought and, and began the, the process of preparing for this message. Um, I want to always to, to say what the Lord wants me to say. And uh, you all know we've been in a, a, a wonderful uh, but challenging stewardship campaign together. And I preached a, a, a number of, of messages on giving. Uh, and thank you, church, for rising up to that challenge. As of last Sunday, uh, you all have committed $3.1 million to the Love Gives campaign. And that's a tremendous effort. Amen. <laughs> Praise the Lord. And uh, we'll continue to update you. We expect for that to continue to grow through the rest of the year. And if you haven't had a chance to give your uh, commitment card, you can drop that in the offering plate uh, or by the office. Uh, as soon as you're able, that will help us. And then, of course, today is our Big Give Sunday. I I've come prepared to give a first fruits offering. And if you're prepared to give that after our worship service is over, you can drop that in the offering plate. Uh, and we're believing for a, to have a big Sunday today that will uh, help us to have a good launch pad into this campaign, uh, not only of, of uh, retiring some uh, retiring debt, uh, but also doing some uh, capital projects together. Uh, but I am so thankful, and I want to say thank you uh, for your responsiveness, but also for your willingness to go through this stewardship journey, because it's not always the easiest journey to take, all right? And, and so um, uh, I said to the Lord as I was preparing my message, Lord, I've been, <laughs> I've been preaching to them at your command about giving. And, and so what you know, what, what would you like me to do uh, this coming Sunday? And almost audibly, he said, tell them what they get. Tell them what they get. I've been talking to him about giving, and giving is very important, but take a little time to tell them what they get. Would you like to know what you get? Because the Bible gives us a great deal of instruction about that. In fact, in, in, out of Jesus' lips, the red letters that we see in the Sermon on the Mount and in verse 12, Jesus says you can, uh, you can rejoice and be glad. You can, uh, and, and the Greek there is, uh, is the, the word for rejoice is the word that Paul uses through, throughout his letters when he speaks about rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say it, re rejoice. It's a, it's a strong word for this, this uh, total transformative gladness in the Lord. Rejoice and be glad. And that, that word is celebrate. Uh, uh, it's translated in, in, in my text as, as be glad. 
That's a little, be glad is a little, uh, it doesn't do enough uh, as, uh, for what, to, what the Greek is really getting across. The word in the Greek means jump up and down, uh, thrilled and, and blown away, excited. Uh, it's not really how you behave in here. It's, uh, so think of how you behave when your football team wins, okay? Uh, maybe you can't jump up and down uh, in here very much, but boy, I know you, all of you can get after it when, you're, when your prospective football team uh, wins. That kind of excitement, that kind of thrill, rejoice and be glad. Why? For your reward in heaven is great. Rejoice and be glad for your reward in heaven is great. And then, of course, this, this deep kingdom twist is that all of this rejoicing and all of the greatness of this reward uh, is in the context of, of a willing, faithful o- obedience in suffering. For, for uh, in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you, they're going to persecute you. But you can rejoice and be glad because there is a reward. Are you glad this morning that there is a reward? Me too. And so it's it's right and good, and Jesus instructs us that we should turn our attention to those things that a good, good father gives us. And he gives us all kinds of things, but he also gives us rewards. And what Jesus, right here in the Sermon on the Mount, uh, his his, uh, principal declaration, his manifesto of the kingdom of God, what kingdom people are like, right here at the beginning, he launches with the declaration, you'll be blessed That's the Beatitudes. He wants us to know you're going to be blessed and you're going to rejoice. And there are rewards and those rewards are great. And that ought to come as an encouragement to you as you walk in the way of the kingdom. We ought to uh, pay attention as Christ followers to the good news that we have a reward. But we have to think rightly about what that reward is. Our problem sometimes is that we... we, we, uh, don't know what the rewards are, or we, uh, we're not uh, excited about what God's rewards are to us. We want different rewards. So we don't know what the rewards are. That's one problem. Or we know what the rewards are, and we don't really like them that much. Uh, my son, Jake, uh, who's sitting on the uh, second row here uh, this morning, when he was four, he told us that he wanted a four-wheeler for Christmas. He wanted a four-wheeler for Christmas. And so we started thinking about that, and, and we, we, uh, we got him an appropriate four-wheeler for a four-year-old. It was a little with the batteries, and you mash the little pedal, and it kind of goes. It wouldn't set any land speed records, but it went plenty fast for a four-year-old. And so Christmas morning came. We opened all the presents, and we took Jake outside, showed him his new, brand-new four-wheeler. He was totally disappointed. <laughs> totally disappointed disappointed. Four-year-old Jake wanted a real four-wheeler, like you could jump over the house with it, like you could uh, tow stuff with it. He wanted a real two-stroke, 5,000 horsepower, jump over a bus four-wheeler. And that's what he thought we had gotten him. And when he saw the little battery-operated one, just for us, he rode it around the driveway once, and he never got on it again. All of you know Jake, and you know Jake's a little bit quiet, but underneath that quietness is a head like concrete. So just, that's for free, but I'm in a head like concrete. What his father wanted for him is not what he wanted. I knew that if I gave Jake what he wanted, he wouldn't be around very long after that. His good father knew what a good gift was, a good reward was, a good response to him was, but Jake's struggle is he didn't want what his father wanted for him. And that's probably your biggest problem problem this morning is that you don't want you don't know and then you don't want what your father has for you but what I want you to know is that these rewards are great your reward in heaven is great it's big it's there's a muchness to it it's far beyond anything you could even conceive of it and yet it is beautifully and specifically and specially designed just for you and God is dying for you to have it how do you know because he allowed his own dear son to come and to die so that you could have these things he wants to give to you. God was actually dying to give you these things. He's made them available through his son. He wants you to open them. So it's right for us that we would rejoice. It's right to rejoice over promised 
rewards. It's right to rejoice over promised rewards. Now, again, the, 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 one of the challenges when we talk about rewards is we don't want to think about rewards the wrong way or have the wrong rewards on our mind. And there are some uh, mistakes that we can make about rewards. The first huge, and please don't, when I talk about gifts and rewards from the Father, don't mistake, make mistake number one. Mistake number one is called works righteousness. It's that works righteousness is the belief that you earn salvation, you earn the approval and the favor of the Father. That is a lie. Uh, and uh, uh, that is not sufficient to save you. You cannot save yourself and you cannot earn God's love or favor. He has won it through Christ and he offers it unconditionally. And so please don't hear if you were raised in a tradition of works righteousness, you gotta earn, you gotta earn it. Don't, don't miss it. I'm not talking about works righteousness, number one. Number two, I'm not talking about prosperity gospel. It's become very popular. A lot of TV preachers, a lot of things you see, a lot, a lot of big churches, uh, they, they run on the rails of a prosperity gospel. Prosperity gospel says this, and I got this great definition from uh, um, a professor, uh, uh, David Jones at the Southeastern Seminary. He said this, uh, uh, prosperity gospel is an expectation uh, of physical health, material wealth, and personal happiness. That uh, if you have the right kind of faith, the, the, a strong enough kind of faith, God always rewards strong faith with, let me get it right here, physical health, material wealth, and personal happiness. That's prosperity gospel. Uh, and it runs counter to the gospel. Uh, that's not what God's up to. And I'm gonna lay out what he is up to, but you may have been raised in a prosperity gospel that if you really are a faithful person uh, and you, uh, you, you really are doing what God wants you to do, you'll be rewarded with the things that the world wants. Because that's what I just described. Those are, those are the things that the world wants. And prosperity gospel teaches that the Christian is rewarded with worldly gifts. And that's, that's not at all what God wants to give you. So don't, don't buy the lie of works righteousness. Don't buy the lie of prosperity gospel. But kind of the other end of that um, uh, is, a, is another thing that I, that I worked hard for, for some language for it. Uh, don't also believe what I call the ticket to the theme park view of your heavenly reward. The, the, the ticket to the theme park view is, uh, I've prayed this prayer a long time ago. It's really made almost no difference in my life. I've, I've really lived the way I've wanted to live, doing the things that I wanted to do. But I, I checked this box a long time ago. And in some distant future, way out in this place, far away from here, I'll, I'll go to this place where I end up getting everything I actually always wanted while I was here. And that's what heaven will be like. It's pie in the sky, by and by. And, and heaven, the reality of heaven, actually has very little bearing on my day-to-day -day life. It's just something that I've I purchased my ticket uh, and, uh, and, and, and I'll go there someday. That is an erroneous view of, a, of the heavenly reward and the way that heaven and earth touch uh, in Christ. And then finally, uh, the, the, the wrong view, because some of you hear about reward and your deal is, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not following God for a reward. I, uh, it's not about me. I don't deserve anything. I'm just a worm. Uh, well, let's not talk about rewards. In fact, my, uh, my commentary on Matthew uh, uh, says that Jesus is not coy when he talks about reward. And some of us are coy about that. Oh, I could never be rewarded. Let's not talk about reward. I'm doing it just because I love God. Well, I'm here to tell you Jesus talks about rewards. All right, and he says rejoice and be glad and be excited about him and talk about him and think about him and let them be a source of encouragement to you. So it is okay for you to be excited about how the Father wants to reward you. Are y'all catching my point here? Not just a, what, what I call a, a, a joyless asceticism, just sort of miserably following the Lord, expecting and hoping for nothing. That is, uh, that is not going to be a sustaining faith, and it's not a picture of New Testament following, okay? So with those, and, and each of those deserves its own sermon, but with those provisos in mind, let's kind of take a look together at what these uh, rewards are. Three things that I want you to see about these, uh, these promised rewards and the call to gratefully anticipate them. First of all, gratefully anticipate awarded rewards, awarded 
rewards. When I gave my outline to Sharon Pippen, she said, try to say it three times fast when you preach it. Awarded rewards. I'm not going to try to say it three times fast. But the misthos is the Greek for reward, and it means, it can also be translated wage. It's a, it's a reaction to or a response to real action. Here's the deal. Here's what I want you to hear. What you do matters. What you do matters. And that's what this means. And as you think through how you're going to be rewarded by a God who loves you, he's going to be responding uh, to your obedience. And so when Jesus is teaching on this, he begins, as I've already said, by saying these are going to be blessings uh, for, for faithfulness. Uh, uh, and these are going to be great gifts. It's God's response to faithful action. He's going to say, and Jesus teaches this in Matthew 25, there's going to be a moment where God says to us, well done, Good and faithful servant. Well done, good and faithful servant. Uh, you've been faithful with little, and now I'm going to give you much. Enter into your reward. What you do matters. And here are the things that, that appear uh, to matter. In chapter 5, verse 12, uh, for endurance in the midst of difficulty. Uh, chapter 5, verse 46, uh, 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 Jesus talks about the rewards of heaven uh, for those who love their enemies. In, uh, in the way that you give, in, in chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. In the way you pray, uh, verses 5 and 6 of chapter 6. In your fasting, uh, there's going to be a reward if you do a, 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 a fasting in a faithful and obedient way. Uh, Matthew 19, verse 27, there's a reward for those who've left everything to follow Jesus. And there's this great inheritance that we receive from serving the least. When you serve the least of these, you, you've, you've, you've served me and there's the reward of, a, of, a, of, of that heavenly, eternal home that we've been promised. What you do matters. And so here in this text that I pointed uh, you to today, you, the, the reward is great for those who suffer just as the prophets have always suffered, just as the righteous people have always suffered, you suffer for righteousness' sake, and there's going to be a, a reward for you, a response of the Father to you. Now, please hear this, this kind of radical obedience. And when you read the Sermon on the Mount, you, one of the things you ought to say when you read the Sermon on the Mount is it tells us about how we're, what, what love really is, loving your enemies, what it means uh, uh, that, that murder is when you just have an evil thought about someone else. You've murdered them. When lust isn't an act, but, it, but really when lust takes place in your mind, it is though you committed adultery. When we hear that standard, what's one of the things, what's one of your responses when you hear the standard of the, of the Sermon on the Mount? What do you think? I can't do it. I can't do it. And that is a proper response until there is a transformational, supernatural work of grace in your life. You don't have the wherewithal to do these things that you've been called to do. But once that transformation has taken place through the, through the surrendering response of faith to that which is given purely by grace, then a doorway opens to an empowering to, 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 to walk in this way of the kingdom. The old Reformed theologians put it like this, and I thought this was pretty good. They talked about the difference between the right to the reward and the possession of the reward. The right to the reward and the possession of the reward. If you're theologically minded, you may want to jot that down, all right? And what they pointed us to, and I think they're right here, is the door to the vault of the blessings of God is closed to all of us because of our sin and you cannot get it open. You can pull on it, dynamite it, do whatever you can. That door is not open to you. The access to the door of God's blessings uh, is, uh, uh, is open through Christ alone, through faith alone, by grace alone. There's nothing you can do to earn it. We are given the right to, to, to the rewards. But what the New Testament teaches is to possess those rewards, to, to have those be living realities in your life. The call of God and the call of the gospel is to start walking in that way, walking in the spirit, walking in that newness of life. And then those, uh, those rewards of God then are become into your possession through obedience and through faithfulness and through surrender, through growth, through maturity. And the promise is... Paul talks about this in Ephesians chapter 1, that this wealth, these riches, this, this uh, uh, 
the, the, the beauty of resurrection power, all of those things become yours. And his prayer is that the eyes of our hearts will be opened to be able to possess what's been won for us through Christ alone. And so the question is, how much do you want? How much of these things that God desires to give to you through obedience do you want? Jonathan Edwards put it this way. He says, you can be in, in an ocean and you can think of, of what God wants for you as an ocean of love. And you can throw all kinds of vessels of all different sizes into that ocean and they'll be full. But the size of the vessel matters. And the size of the vessel of your reception and possession of all the things God wants for you is, is affected by your response of obedience. What you do matters. Paul again, Paul, the apostle of grace, says you need to be careful how you build on the foundation of Jesus Christ. You can build with gold, silver, and precious stones, or you can build with wood, hay, and stubble, and that's going to be evaluated. That's going to be judged. And some people are going to uh, enter into heaven uh, smoking, you know, crispy, skin of their teeth, just barely in, because they didn't build well. But what they do did matter. And if you're out here thinking, I'm going to be one of those skin of the teeth Christians, that's my plan. I'm, I'm, I'm going to be one of these Christians that just skates in uh, under the wire. That's evidence that you don't know the Lord. That's evidence that you have not tasted and seen that the Lord is good, if that's your attitude. If that's who Jesus is to you, if that's what the goodness of God is to you, that it's just gonna be this game of self-interest that you play, you've missed the meaning of the gospel. What you do matters. Does this make you rejoice? Does this make you rejoice? Are you excited that a God of heaven looks at little old you and is moved by your obedience. He's moved by your surrender. He's encouraged and wants to encourage you in your walk of faith. And do you want these, this possession of all of God's rewards to be maximal in your life? I want the most things. I want all the things that God has for me. They're, first of all, awarded rewards. But awarded by who? That's the second thing I want you to see is that they're fatherly rewards. In chapter 6, verse 4, verse 6, and verse 18, it says, Your Father in heaven will reward you. Your Father in heaven will reward you. And the reward is a fatherly reward. The heart of what God wants to give you, the, the center of what God wants to give you is himself. He wants to give you himself. He wants to know you. He wants to be with you. He wants you to be like him. That's the heart of the giving of the Father. And of course, once again, it's deeply gracious. It's the gift of a father to a child, not because the child has earned it, but because of the Father's great love and great power and great wisdom and great desire to have a fellowship with his children, to make a way for them to be in fellowship with himself. It's the reward of his presence. It's his glory. That's, the, that's the, uh, the great reward of God for us, his glory and his will for us. Father, I, Jesus says, as, as, as the son of the father, I want to do your will. I want to know you, and I want to do what you called me to do. This is the reward that we're promised. In the Beatitudes, chapter 5, verses 8 and 9, you'll see God, and you'll be children of God, sons of God, and daughters of God. Revelation chapter 2, 22, 4 says one of the great things about heaven is going to be this. You'll see him face to face. Won't that be good? You'll be able to, to, to gaze upon his glory. There won't be any temple in heaven because the, the, the Father and the Son are the temple. And their glory is that which we are able to behold. John, 1 John chapter 3, verse 2 says this. Uh, uh, on, on that day, uh, we'll We'll be like him because we'll see him as he is. Paul says, a day is coming when I'm going to know him as I am fully known. Those are great promises. They're, they're, the, they're, they're the rewards and the promises of a loving father. Paul tended to speak of the love of God and the conformity with the Son and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. That's a picture of this relational gifting 
of the triune God, the depth of that kind of fellowship for us. He wants to give us himself. When my kids were littler, I used to give them an allowance. Any of you parents out there give your kids an allowance, all right? And they got their allowance for doing their chores. Now, I got to tell you, uh, when a kid is seven, um, they don't mow the grass as good as I can mow the grass. All right? I, mine didn't even mow the grass at seven. When they were, my sons were, were 10 or 12, they mowed the grass. When, when kids are seven or eight, they don't do the dishes very well. My point is this. I could have done those chores and tasks much more easily myself. Okay? But I wanted them to grow and learn some responsibilities. I wanted them to see uh, what they could do. I wanted them to learn some things about, about the, the value of hard work. I wanted them to learn some character. And even though I provided for them and they weren't earning that and uh, they, they weren't uh, sufficiently paying me back for all that I was providing for them as their father, that, that reward and that allowance was a way for me to say, I see you. I see what you're doing. It's important and valuable to me and it's very valuable to you. You're becoming the kind of person I want you to become. And this is a way for me to say, that's a great job. Thank you. Well done. Good work. This is the direction I want you to move in. This kind of character is it's, the, it's like the best part of me. And so this good father gives good gifts and good rewards to his children because he loves that they're like him and they're in pursuit of him. And he wants to say, I love you and I see you and what you do is important to me. And it's, it's very valuable to me. And I want you to see me like I see you. Is that how you rejoice? Do you rejoice over the, the reward, the possession and possibility of the presence of the Father that's yours now as a guarantee and ultimately will be. Uh, Paul says right now we see through a mirror darkly, but one day how are we going to see him? Face to face. And again, what has God had to do to provide you with the access to that kind of presence? He sent his own son to die. So he could throw open those doors of his presence with you. Once again, Jonathan Edwards, who, who might, uh, is wrongly considered to be one of these glum ascetics, one of these joyless ascetics. He was one of those Puritan guys. But he was actually a theologian of the affections. He was a preacher of the first great awakening and saw revival come in a powerful way. And here's what he said about a heart that's transformed, a heart that, that's on fire for the Lord, a life that's warmed by the presence of God and, and a love of the glory of God. What Edward says is emotions and affections towards the things of the Lord, they're, they're not everything. They're not the sole proof that someone is saved. But if someone has no transformational affection for the love of the Father a serious inclination they've never been changed by the gospel you should be falling ever more in love with the God who loves you the greatest reward God gives is the reward of himself and he wants to make that abundant in your life the father and the son and the spirit pouring themselves out and into you and so is this the reward you're looking for talk to Dennis Watson about this all the time. One of, the, one of our verses that we love to talk about is, is, is Paul's statement, I want to know Christ, the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering. I want to know him so bad that I'm willing for God to do anything to pull out any barrier between me and him so that I can, so that I can know him the way he knows me. Is that the reward you're looking for? Awarded rewards, fatherly rewards, and finally, kingdom rewards. Your Father in heaven will reward you. These, the reward in heaven is great. And what Jesus was doing in his announcement of the kingdom is it was heaven breaking in, the new creation breaking into the old. Through Christ, transformation comes. Everything that God intended for what he made that we ruined, he's restoring. And the reward of Christ is that restoring, redeeming power that changes lives and then uses those change lives to change others. It's the reward of the kingdom. And so once again, the blessings, blessed are you, 
That's how Jesus begins the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are you. What do you get? You get the kingdom. You inherit uh, the earth. Uh, you receive the comfort of God. Uh, you receive satisfaction for a, a, a level of righteousness in him. He, Jesus will go on to say in chapter 5, uh, you'll, um, uh, men will see your good works, your obedience, your faithfulness and sacrifice. They'll see your good works, and what will they do? They'll glorify your Father in heaven. The the, the kingdom will come to you and through you, and then it'll touch those around you who see the, the glory of God reflected out of your life, and they'll be changed. And then Jesus goes on throughout the rest of the Sermon on the Mount to talk about how your relationships are transformed, and your, your marriages are transformed, your friendship, your worship, your prayer life, everything is utterly transformed so that the light and love of Christ shines out of you and pictures this new creation, this new life kingdom of God, eternal life. It happens now. It has happened through Christ. And it will grow and move and culminate in the new creation. New Jerusalem coming down out of heaven. The old is gone. The new has come. And through Christ Jesus, God is constructing this new world we'll enjoy forever. Do you not think that's good news? No more tears and no more suffering and no more brokenness. And instead filled with the things that we were a part of, that we did for the glory of God, and for the advance of his kingdom. And we'll celebrate and enjoy those things. And the book of Revelation says we'll cast those crowns, those crowns of obedience and suffering and sacrifice. We'll cast those down. in worship before the one who is worthy of that. And that'll characterize eternal life forever and ever. When Paul, Paul and John taught, they didn't use the word kingdom as much as, uh, as it appears in the gospels, but they, they uh, had terminology that was equivalent to it. And so Paul and John both would speak again of this new creation, a favorite word of theirs when they talked about the kingdom and the kingdom coming into an individual is life. Both John and Paul loved the word life. Without Jesus, you're dead. And you're trapped in dead works. And Paul says, all you can do is sow to the flesh and reap what the flesh gives you. And then Christ comes and changes everything and he raises you again to life. Jesus says in John's gospel in chapter 10, verse 10, you know the verse, I have come that you might have life and have it abundantly to the full now and growing and building and crescendoing all the way in to the ultimate new creation at the return of Christ and the conclusion of this old world. John and Paul and Jesus also like to talk about fruit. That's a kingdom reward. Uh, Paul talks about the fruit of the Spirit. So your life and the reward of this kingdom fruit in your life is a life that's characterized by love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Let me ask you, are those the fruit that you're looking for? You need to think about that. And is that fruit on display in your life now? When people, after they've talked to you, when you're standing in a line that's too long, okay? And that, will they leave you and say, that is the most loving, joyful, faithful, gentle, kind, self-controlled person I've ever met. Is that what they'll say? Because that's what they should say. Because the gift and the reward of the kingdom is that kind of fruit in your life and then the fruit out of your life that people are coming to faith because of you. It's the best thing. It's the thing for which you were made and redeemed is that your life might be an instrument of God that brings the gospel and that transfer, transformational redemption into their lives as well. And all of that is the glory and the joy of heaven. I say this all the time, but it's one of my favorite things to think about is in heaven, you think, well, what are we gonna do for all, for, for all of eternity? We're gonna do lots of stuff. But one of the things that we're going to do is we're gonna get to hear the end of all the stories. 
We're going to get to hear the gospel end to all the stories. And I believe it will take eternity to hear the end of all the gospel stories. And on the day when we finally heard the end of all the gospel stories, you know what we're all going to say? Let's tell them again, right? Let's tell them again. Those are so good. Let's go over it again. We'll never get tired of hearing and we'll always be constantly amazed at hearing the whole story. Two years ago, a young man named Eve, Eve is a, is a man's name in, in French, and Eve stood before us. He had on this scarf, and he told the story of being a Rwandan refugee in Uganda, having family that went through the Rwandan genocide. And he was filled with hate. And he got invited to this big party. And they put a little red shoebox in his lap. And it had been a long time since he had gotten anything good. And he opened his little Operation Christmas Child shoebox. And there were all kinds of toys and things. But there was also the gospel. And he heard the gospel and he believed it. But he also had a scarf, this scarf. How much good is a scarf in Uganda? <laughs> Not that helpful, all right? But over the, over the years, in faith, he held on to that scarf. And he is now ministering in Canada. And the long story of God through his life, through somebody just like you. By the way, we're 25 boxes short of our goal. So let's, we can finish that out today. All right, so we're doing, doing well in that. But Eve's story is bound up with the story of somebody just like you who took a, what we might regard as a, as a small step of faith, not the biggest check you've ever written, not the biggest gift you've ever given, but you, you heard about an opportunity and you responded in faith believing and someone just like you packed up one of those shoe boxes and, and made a way, not knowing where it would go and it landed in this little boy's hand in Uganda and the world is changed. The broken, sick, old creation of genocide and hate is overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of the testimony. And something new begins, and there's a hope and a promise, a scarf. He barely even knew what a scarf was, but it was a word of promise over what his life would be all the way from Uganda to Canada. Because that's, that's a God who loves to bear fruit. Apart from him, we can do nothing. Abiding in him, we bear much fruit. About 10 years ago, I heard a little girl from Ukraine share her Operation Christmas Child shoebox story. She was in an orphanage in Ukraine. How, do you, how nice do you think things are in an orphanage in Ukraine in the mid-2000s? It's, it's hard to describe it. Now, this is a little person who's never had anything good to happen to them ever. So she has no memory of anything good or nice happening to her. And that context of the crashed Soviet Union still was fairly godless. There was no instruction about God, and she just sort of absorbed the atheism of the, of the milieu and, and where she was raised. And so she didn't believe in God, and it was easy to not believe in God because there was nothing good about her world. But some boxes came to her orphanage, and she got one of them. And without meaning to, deep down in her heart, not even knowing what it was, a prayer went up. I hope there's a toothbrush in this box. She, she couldn't help it. She couldn't help to say it. She didn't know where it came from. And she didn't know why she would offer it up. But somehow that desire, and can you imagine wanting your very own toothbrush? Just do the math on that. And she offered that up in prayer. She opened up that box. And not only was there a toothbrush, but it was pink. And it had sparkles all over it. And it uh, buzzed when you turned it on. And that little toothbrush came bursting into her life. And with it, this declaration, a God who said, I love you. And I see you. 
And there are people you don't know about that are thinking about you and that wanted you to have a Christmas present. And your story is just beginning. And toothbrush, given in faithful obedience, bears fruit and changes the world. And I don't know about you, but that's a good reward. That's a good reward. And it's a story that we will enjoy and share forever together in the heavenly places. We can rejoice for the good rewards through Christ Jesus, through his spirit and the will of the Father, that we have the calling to become exactly who he created and redeemed us to be. That ought to make you rejoice. That ought to make you celebrate. That ought to make you want to dance with joy because that's what a good father wants to give to you. Let's pray together. It's very important in this moment as we come to the invitation to to remember a distinction I made so you don't miss the most important thing. Until you bend your knee and surrender to the free gift of salvation that you cannot earn. Then you stand outside of saving faith. And the door to the to the good things that God has done everything he can do to open to you that door will stay closed because you can't buy it you can't earn it it is freely given and must be freely accepted now what you're saying yes to is nothing less than the lordship of Jesus Christ over your life I surrender all but through that doorway of the gospel is a connection to a father who loves you. And so we're gonna stand and sing and if you've never bowed your knee to the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, today is the day and you can come and take my hand or take the hand of one of the pastors. I promise through the promise of God's word as the gospel of God changes everything. Others of you, it's time to make this church your home. We're trying to walk in the will of the Father together. And one of the great gifts of God to, to the people he loves is the gift of the church, the gift of one another. So you can come and make this church your home. And then finally, in this Thanksgiving season, Maybe you can just come to this altar and kneel and say, God, give me a fresh appreciation for what you've given me in Christ Jesus. I want it all. The rewards in heaven are great, and I want to receive and experience them greatly in my own life. Call me to fresh obedience. Call me to a hunger for kingdom priorities. Stir in me a fresh desire to know you, O God put at the center of my heart's desire the kingdom life and kingdom fruit which are the only things that will remain into eternity oh God I pray that together we would experience the rewarded reality that comes through the cross ask it in Jesus name. Amen. Would you stand? This hymn of invitation is for you. This is the time where if you need to make a decision, you come, we'll receive you here. Say yes to Jesus. Make this church your home. Do what the Lord is asking you to do this morning. You come as we sing. Amazing love that welcomes me. The kindness of mercy 
that bought with blood wholeheartedly my soul undeserving God you're so good God you're so you bow your heads the music's going to stop and just acapella I sort of felt led why don't you just lead us through that refrain again about God's just our voices God you're so good God you're so good God You. you can be seated. Good morning. I'm Rachel. This weekend, I hope you've been reminded of those who are serving and those who have served in protecting America. Thank you, veterans, for your sacrifice and service. Church, remember to pray for our servicemen and women and their families as they fight for our freedom. It's been a great morning in worship today. We are excited to see how the Lord is going to move on Big Give Sunday. Remember, you may give your Love Gives gifts online as well. Commitment cards are also available if you have not yet been able to turn in one. We are the central drop-off location of Operation Christmas Child shoeboxes for all of Baldwin County. Drop-off begins tomorrow. This means we will need many, many hands and backs to help load boxes and move big boxes. Scan this code here and see if you can come at any of the times listed. Pastor Brent and Pastor Sean would love to see you here. This Wednesday is our Thanksgiving meal together. It begins at 5.30. Note that different time. Pastor Eric will share a devotion during the meal. Since we are expecting a large crowd, we need you to sign up for this event so Chef Bill can prepare enough food. The code is right here, or you can sign up through our website or app. Christmas at First is going to be ready for you to share socially and with inviter cards, so watch for those. The very first weekend, you'll want to watch out for our first kids float in the Christmas parade, December 1st, and then the next morning, December 2nd, is Breakfast with Santa. December 3rd, our deacons are hosting an event called Common Threads. This is a luncheon for all those who have lost their spouse. Common Threads will be after worship and Bible study. If you have not been to a Bible study class here at First Baptist, don't miss out on this blessing. There are all sorts of classes, and to help you find a class, we have people ready to help out. Head to the welcome desk and meet them. Thank you for being here today, and thank you for listening. Well, it's a great joy for me to have worshiped with you this morning. Uh, it's going to be a uh, 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 so exciting to see what God has for us as we move into the Christmas and, uh, and Thanksgiving seasons. And so just be looking for all the ways that we're going to worship and use that opportunity to point other people to the reason for the season. Steve Parrish, one of our wonderful deacons, uh, is going to dismiss us in prayer. Why don't y'all stand uh, and then make sure uh, that uh, if you don't have a Sunday school community, uh, try one out today. We'll point you to one uh, at the welcome desk just outside. Uh, great to see you this morning. Steve.
Please bow your heads with me. Dear Lord in heaven, Father God, you are our sole provider for everything. Father God, you are above all others. And Father, everything we have has come from you. Lord God, just thank you for your loveness, love. Thank you for your kindness. Thank you for your mercy. And thank you for your gentleness with us. Father God, just um, pray, Lord God, as we go out this week, Father God, that we'll show your, uh, your bright light uh, sharply, Lord, to this dark world that we walk into. Father, just um, please um, pray that um, we see you working in our lives and the lives of those around us, Father God, just to deepen our faith and our trust in you, Lord. You are good in all things. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.